reminds me of this time that I recorded on the podcast, but we're good? Okay, we'll go. All right, welcome back to another edition of Tiger's Win Take Two. First take was really good. It was about a minute long, yeah. and T-Bob described his shirt. Um, we'll get back to that in a second. But before we do, let me introduce introduce to those who are listening. We have Jacob Hester. We have T-Bob Bear, hosts of uh, Off the Bench, 104.5 ESPN, and a number of other stations statewide. Uh, guys, thank you for being on the show. I should have started the last time like that, but uh, thank you. Hell yeah, Cody. Uh, no, thank you, man. You've done a lot of free work for us over here, <laughs> over the years. I really, so. I, really, I really have. I've thought about that. <laughs> You've been a host, a co-host, a guest. You really hit the trifecta. I finally had to stop asking you because I was like, guys, I'm not going to keep asking people to come in here and work for free. I'm just like, I'm not doing it anymore. But Yeah, it was, at first it was exciting and, you know, I would get a little clout, a little, uh, little attention, and then it just got old. So yeah. don't, 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 don't ask me to come back. I'm not, uh, I'm not But I'm yeah, not so I'm back. glad to be able to uh, pay back the favor a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I appreciate sure. you guys. Guys, like I said uh, earlier, this, the tone is going to be a little bit different. Um, th- this podcast is about excellence and it's about success. And, yes. you know, it's pretty obvious in the name there, Tigers Win, as it's here on the board. It's about um, the things that you take away from your experiences at LSU apply to the rest of your life. You guys are both shining examples of that, but um, maybe slightly different tone for this episode it, while still focusing on the same subjects. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, like I said, we did just clear a couple bo- bottles of vodka off the table. It's uh, it's 1045. Um, hey, perks, T-Bob of the, su- perks of the job. T-Bob dude. suggested maybe drinking them. Um, we'll maybe save that for Well, for it would just time. be really funny if we were ca- – like who the hell casually drinks bottles of vodka? And you saw the <laughs> bottles. They weren't like full handles. They looked like – it, looks like right, a, it was You're like right. beer bottle like size, but vodka. Yeah. So, yes, there's a lot of comedic value in just casually sipping raspberry vodka or whatever. <laughs> and not saying anything were. about yes, it. Yes, yes, and not acknowledging it. I agree. All right, well, um, there's no natural segue, but explain your shirt because yeah, we're talking about Yeah, so we were talking game. about like being a button-up shirt, right? Yeah. They were a button-up show, shirts unbuttoned, showing off the chest hair. But uh, even this is my weekend shirt. I love it. I wear it all the time. I love the vibes that it gives me. But it does have like special meaning as well. It kind of dovetails with the pod because yes, uh, my it's it was my grandfather's shirt. He passed last year from COVID, and me and him growing up, he is the reason why uh, I ended up in Baton Rouge. Why I ended up at LSU? Like he raised me die hard LSU from. I I think I kind of had my awakening around nine years old when it came to LSU football. So we're thinking like. Kind of around like 98, 99, 2000. Yeah, same, so really, I, I joined in the golden era. Yeah. Like essentially. Because then Shaven shows up and then everything, you know, that, that's when my memory started to kick in. But he went to school there in the 50s. When he's been at every national championship live uh, before, obviously, the 2019 one. But um, so that was always our connection. It was really special. And when he passed, he has the most legendary collection of LSU Hawaiian shirts. And uh, they were passed down to me. And so... If you're watching online, you can see it, but if not, it's like gray. It's got like some palm trees, some flamingos, like little Spanish town type vibes, yellow, LSU all over it. But uh, yeah, it's one of a few that I got from him. But, but yes, I would not be at this job, sitting at this table, talking to you if it were not for him. So it's actually an incredibly appropriate shirt to have it's on. It's a beautiful metaphor for what we want to talk about. And also, you look very beautiful in it. So Thank I just, you. I just want to compliment it. I, I, I do like my chest hair. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, you do. You I'm, I'm a fan of it. I do flaunt it. Because it's not an aggressive amount, but it's also not non-existent either. So I feel like it hits a nice little good <laughs> in-between station. Like I said, the tone's going to be different. Uh, Hester, same, same. Coach same. Trina didn't talk about her chest hair? <laughs> Are you what? sure? <laughs> I mean, uh, that didn't happen. She doesn't, oh, she doesn't, we talk to my, her every week. Dude, you want to talk about chest hair? My grandpa's chest hair? That dude. <laughs> See, I mean, that thing was to right, creep up into his ears. Like, <laughs> like coming out the ears. So he passed down the chest hair and the shirt. Yeah, yes, go. exactly. Uh, Hester, how did you get uh, attached to LSU sports? All right, so my journey was one, uh, as far as getting into the sports media world, was one that I actually – Got the itch when I was playing for the Chargers. Uh, I co-hosted a radio show out in San Diego, and they allowed me to talk about whatever I wanted. And out on the West Coast, like you could talk about soccer mm-hmm. as well. So mm-hmm. like I fell in love instantly. And as soon as I did that, I went to the Chargers PR staff. I'm like, hey, if y'all have any co-hosting opportunities, any hosting opportunities, any interviews that y'all want done, I will never say no because I want the reps. I want to be able to do that. And so that was probably 2010 when that started. So I I would just continually do them over and over again. Same thing when I went to the Broncos and actually I was with the new Orleans saints in 2014 and this opportunity came Cox sports uh, TV called me. Actually they called Michael Bonnet who thankfully recommended me to do LSU game day live. And it was obviously a live TV show. It was me. It's going to be Gordy rush, Victor Howell, Emily Dixon, 
and Kevin Mawai. And I was with the Saints, and this opportunity came up. And I said, you know what? I might make the Saints. I might not. I'm vested already. I've got my benefits. I've really, I, I'm, I'm tired of moving my family across yeah. the country. I want to get involved with LSU media. And that was a way through CST because it was a, a live game day show on the campus. Away trips were inside the other stadium as well. And so at that moment, I decided to retire from football and concentrate on getting into sports media, getting around LSU and never really look back. And, and that opportunity I'm so thankful for because, you know, if I turn that down, if I try to make the Saints roster, who knows if it really parlays into what my career has turned into. So I've got to give a big shout out to CST and to my guy, Michael Barnett for suggesting me for that show. T Bob, what about yeah. your, what about your transition um, into this career? I kind of remember you getting into it like in the, the early 2010s. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was. So I remember, uh, I'm actually kind of the opposite of Jake in that I never thought that I wanted to do anything in this. Um, so I always had friends and stuff in college that used to tell me like that's what you should do afterwards, right? Is like do like radio or something like that. Yeah, and you were. I remember you being. I didn't cover you, um, but I did cover you. Just, just call a, me old. Yes. Yeah. Just basically. A, just a smidge. I think I I started covering LSU your senior year. Yeah. And I remember you being very good with the media and. Yeah. So that was kind of like you know. So that was kind of it. I I, I I'd always liked stuff like this and. I, I guess I just, I don't know, I just never thought of being in sports media. Maybe it's because when I was an athlete and sometimes, you know, and I, I think that our job, we are fundamentally at odds with the people that we cover. Yep. It is next to impossible to maintain friendships with the people that you cover because eventually you're going to have to, like, talk shit about them, yep. right? And so it was a situation where... I had been in that locker room. I was fresh out of it. And I just didn't think I wanted to be on the other side of that equation. I think I also, like, there are parts of this job that I don't have to do that I thought I was going to have to do originally that I didn't love. Like, back in the day when I was starting at WWL, uh, I had to go to the Saints locker room all the time, like, cover those scrums. And I don't yep. like that. Like, yep. I, I do not like that. But I just like trying to have fun yep. and make people entertained. So that is the part that I really love. But I guess the long-winded way of just saying that I didn't think I was going to end up here and I just ended up here out of sheer necessity uh, because I got cut from the Rams and I was like, I don't know what to do, dude. I, I didn't handle school correctly. Yeah. Like, I just kind of did whatever I needed to do just to play football. Yeah. And so I was like, I need to get paid. I was engaged at the time. And, um, and, and I remember Derek Panamski back in the day had told me through, like, covering the team that, hey, if you ever want to do some radio, give me a call. And so I called him. Started doing Monday and Thursday nights with him and Jordy. That's when I was supposed to, to be doing sales. Yeah, I was six to eight Monday, Thursday nights. I was supposed to be doing sales. Told that story today. I would just <laughs> lie to my bosses all the time and be like, oh, yeah, I'm out here. And, like, I always lied. I always said I was in Gonzales. Maybe because it was far away. So, like, they Just they far enough away to not be checked yeah, on. Exactly. But just close enough to be believable. Yeah, yes. so they're like, I was like, I'm just beating the streets, guys. And then I'd, like, go back to, like, playing horse or video games or whatever as I was doing. So... After a year of that, I was like, I want to do the radio thing. I love that part of it. I'm yeah. obviously not going to do sales. And then uh, and then I'm just a, uh, I'm a beneficiary of nepotism. Because yeah. when I was looking for a job, an opportunity arrived at WWL. And because of my old man and who he is over there, I think he kind of planted the bug in the boss's ear. They liked the idea. Next thing I know, I got a job that I definitely would never have gotten in just a fully objective playing field where I got to host a morning show 6 to 9 a.m. on 13:50 a.m. over there in New Orleans. Well, and also, I was like at like 23. And I'll also say because you mentioned your time at LSU and working with the media and doing things, I was spoiled. Like I had Michael Bonnet, Thrill Martin, and Brian Miller. Yeah, like that. That was the SIDs when I was in school, and so they really set us up for success. So when we really did, dropped off since then, by the way, just did, a terrible. Hi, I got some Barry Barrio, I believe is the guy's just name. Just a clown show. My gosh. Instead of that Kent Lowe guy, right? It's yeah. Pathetic. That guy. Hey, so. hey, hey. There's some things that we, there's some things <laughs> we, that we don't about. even joke about. The future guests, by the way, on this <laughs> there, there we go. But, no, I mean, they, they set you up, and they, and they give you the examples of what you should say and how you should go about handling an interview. And I can say, like, I was, I was way more prepared than other guys that were with the Chargers even guys that have been in the league for a long time because I, I knew exactly how you're supposed to handle an interview. And if you tell someone, yeah, I'll join your show at 11 o'clock, be ready at 11 o'clock, or hey, I, I will, I'll meet you outside to do that interview after practice, don't leave them sitting there for an hour and a half while you're in the hot tub and cold tub. No, you said you would be there. And I learned all those things because of the LSU SID team. That, so like those, those moments and you create those relationships with the media, 
I know that helped me in my career. Yeah, uh, I mean, without a doubt, um, Dr. Karam even. I mean, whatever, yeah. yes. Just playing at a place like LSU, and then when both me and Jake were there playing for national championships, you just do a media every yeah. day. And then during my career, I felt like I also saw the good and the bad side of it because I went through, you know, an eight and five year, but probably for me personally more. My first year starting, we went nine and four, and the offensive line wasn't good. And so it was an exercise in learning how to constantly answer the same questions about why you suck every Tuesday, <laughs> but like manage to just keep a brave face about it and not let it get to you. Yeah. Um, I, I have a, I think you guys can provide unique insight into, into this, and I kind of come from the same territory people love local sports radio like there is a real community yeah. affinity for it which i felt when i've come and worked for free um, yeah. I'm paid. but i got i got i got paid in that love there right or, or sometimes that you gotta that, love paying for uh <laughs> what is it exposure yeah, yeah. it's like we're uh, paying you an exposure Get um and then sometimes there's a negative side but for the most part the fans are very loyal um they're, they're very committed and so there's a love that i think you you form with Radio and with talk in particular, it's an intimate format. Whether it's a podcast or radio, you um, your listeners are are very very engaged. Um, but before you get to that point, I think you have to suck first, and I don't think people realize that you have to yes. get your reps in. And you talked about that a little while ago, and I remember my first encounter with radio was in 2012. It was my first, my second day at Tiger Ag, my first week at Tiger Ag, and I walked into our Tuesday morning meeting that we had at Tiger Ag that were. Um, standing meetings every Tuesday, and my boss, Jim Inkster, said, all right, you're doing radio tonight. And I had never done radio before in my entire life, and I was terrified. And he was like, yeah, you're just going to go sit in front of a microphone and talk. Just you? It was me, Jeff Palermo, okay, thank okay, God, right, a yeah. pro who, okay. who had, who had yeah. been through it, but just me and Jeff. And then yeah. we had guests, never done radio before, and I remember like the mic being there and like literally Oof, thinking, God, yeah. this mic is huge. Like, how do I, how do, I do this? And just started doing it and probably wasn't very good at first, but it was that same six to eight slot that you were talking about. Probably not that many people listening. And Jake, you can, Jake did the six yeah, to eight. This, well. And you can just get your reps in. You can make mistakes. You can try things. And then I started listening to like Levitard and seeing how they did stuff and listened to obviously all the stuff that you guys did at 104.5. And so you kind of get, you kind of figure out where you fit into that. And I think a lot of people listening right now are fans of you guys or fans of sports radio and wonder what that, that, that world is like maybe some people think oh i could do that put me in front of a microphone i could do it but it's not that easy you don't just turn it on how was it for you guys finding your legs in this industry and making mistakes and being bad and eventually finding your voices okay so for me i i started on the other side i started on tv i didn't start mm. in radio and then once i started with radio it was up in shreveport and i was with a, a pros pro and tim fletcher he'd been mm -hmm. doing it for like 20 25 years and i was just kind of the co-host and so even that, like I have my struggles, but yep. like he's leading it. I'm just sitting here. I'm answering questions about football. It's an hour long show. I, I'm fine, whatever. And so, it, you know, you do that and then you feel like, oh, I can do this. And then it's like, no, you're going to sit in first chair and you're going to host a show. It's like, wait, what? <laughs> I'm going to sit there. I got to bring us in and out of breaks. And yep. it's so funny. It's like, you think that's no big deal, but once you do it and you've got to really handle the flow of the show, it's a completely different beast than sitting in that chair and answering questions. And so like T-Bob, like you're talking about, when I go back and I listen to those first couple of shows because Gordy gave me this opportunity because we worked together on the TV side of things and I had done so much radio, but it was always as a co-host and not a lead. And I remember sitting in that chair and thinking, okay, you're doing okay. <laughs> but you listen back to yourself like, hey, welcome back in, hang with Hester here. Yeah. Four, five. It's like you're whispering. Oof. You don't have a great flow to it. You you don't put any bass behind your voice when you're, when you're really passionate about something because you're yep. so nervous about it. And it's through those reps and you, just, you have to go through it. Yeah. Everyone goes through it. Nobody just sits behind there. I know some people probably think you uh, or tell you they were perfect the first time they did it. Nobody's perfect. You can't sit behind that chair and be perfect the first time you do it. But it's about organically, for me at least, organically finding what you're passionate about and finding your sweet spot. And for me, my sweet spot initially was flustering. It was bringing in Matt Flynn, Richard mm -hmm. Dixon, my mm -hmm. old teammates, and we just opened up the mics and we act like they weren't there. Yep. We act like the TV camera wasn't on. We weren't on the radio. We were sitting here having fun talking about our experience when we played winning a national title for LSU, the current team, like we would if we were sitting back in, in, in the, the back porch watching and, and grilling out. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. And that's when I found my comfort zone, my sweet spot, and what I wanted my radio style to be because I didn't want to fake it. I don't want to show up and talk like this guy every time. We're going to go to break and sound like Casey Kasem. Like, I didn't want to do that. Casey yeah. Kasem's great. He was great at what he did, but that's not who I 
want it to be. And so it took me some time, but it ha had had to happen organically. You can't force that because if you force it, then you're doing radio that's not for you. It's for someone else and you're not going to be passionate about it. And it's going to come across that way. Yeah, I look, I'm a big believer in um, I love Malcolm Gladwell. And I think there is a lot of truth to kind of the 10,000 hours idea where natural talent exists, right? Now you can yep. be naturally adept at something, uh, but you will never get good at something unless you practice it. And, and I, there is a direct correlation between the more you do something, uh, the better you get at it. And so, yeah, you listen to like early shows from when you start out. You definitely, it's very, very cringy. I've actually never done. It. I don't want. I was to about do to say I would never Sounds go back and listen I to my early never, shows. Yeah, I will I, never. I try, go back. I try to treat it like film study because, like, like that God. was one of my advantages. Yeah, no, my sure. advantages in football weren't because of my skill set compared to other guys, right? I mean, I think that's. Well, it's if you're an say, artist, but you for have me, to be... it was knowing exactly what I needed to improve on. Well, it's like my wife was a. Um, uh, she's a photographer, right? And so her college experience was filled with like brutal, uh, self-aware, brutally honest art critiques. Yeah. Uh, watching film is yeah. a brutally self-aware sort of thing. So I try to force myself to go back and listen to some. It still is hard, but I would really, uh, I, I probably want even a few more years before I go back and listen to some of those first shows that I used to do six to nine uh, and, but like, and then in terms of cutting your teeth though, um, it just comes over time. And for me personally, probably my biggest cutting of the teeth phase. So we did a six and nine show over a couple of years and the eight to midnight slot opened mm -hmm. up on WWL and I started doing that. Solo. Uh, it was with Christian most of the time, Christian okay. Garrick, but during the summer, he had so much bank vacation from working there over like 10 years that he would basically take off the summer. Mm -hmm. So learning to do eight to midnight solo in the slowest sports time of the year made it to where, you know, like nothing else will really intimidate me after that from like a broadcasting standpoint. Yeah. And I know that if the shit hits the fan, I can just talk about nothing. Uh, like I, I, I can at least fill the time. Now, can it be entertaining? Uh, if you don't prepare, <laughs> you're going to miss yeah, a lot, right? right? Yeah, like sure. improv is a lot of times the majority BS and sub with like gold kind of interlaced within. So sometimes it's great, but, yeah. but yeah, no, I, it's not to say that you don't prepare, but certainly uh, it, everything in life is just one long journey of getting better. Whatever you do. It's like, I taught that yoga class the other night. I did terrible. I was so nervous. I felt so out of my element. I was like, that's speeding. so funny. I mean, I host a radio I show every morning. Yeah, like I thousands think people listen to right? That, exactly. But it's a setting that I'm not used to, that I had no reps at. It's something that's outside of my comfort zone. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, uh, the, these people thought I was putting them into like an LSU workout because I was going so fast. <laughs> did you uh, scream? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no I like did Moffitt, not. No. But like, no, I was too nervous to give that kind of energy. But like, but like, I, I was going so fast. I was like an actor, like reading through the lines too fast. Somebody yeah. gets on radio and starts for sure. And you got to remember, like Aaron Rodgers when he's been hosting Jeopardy. What is one of the main notes that he he has in front of his face at all time? It says slow down, underline, and bolded. So anything in life is reps and learning it. And and you're no matter how good you are at something naturally, uh, you're never going to be truly good at it unless you just have the opportunity to put a ton of time into it. I remember one of the struggles I had the first couple of times I did radio was I would run out of breath. I would oh, be yeah. I would be talking so fast right. that I would physically like get winded by the end of a sentence and like barely squeak out the end of the sentence yeah. and then thank yeah. god jeff was there jeff was there to like pick up the pieces and keep it moving and like he could like see it like he could see the panic in my eyes he was like all right i'm gonna make this question a little bit longer for cody and let him catch like, why are breath. you turning blue cody <laughs> but it'll still happen every now and then to me sometimes if i'm really hyped about an interview that can that can still happen to me uh, have y'all ever been a guest on a show and like you're walking and you're uh, on the phone yeah and you're that, that's what happens when i'm like it happens back and forth. almost yeah. every interview because i can't sit still like yeah. i'm not going to just sit here and, and do a phone interview and so i kind of pace i yeah. pace back and forth and by the end of it i'm like you probably sound like you're running a marathon on the other end of this so it still happens yep it's it's not a good feeling um makes you feel your age i want to ask you guys about um coming together and doing doing a show together and finding that balance, that chemistry, finding those same legs, working together, teamwork, those kinds of ideas, which I'm sure you're used to from your days at LSU and you're in a locker room with 115 guys and you got coaches and all this stuff. But then there's this setting, which, like I said earlier, is very intimate. And um, you guys have worked with different co-hosts and different mm -hmm. people throughout your careers. And then all of a sudden you're pushed together and 
now you have a show together and you've got to figure out those things on the fly. And uh, maybe it maybe it instantly clicked. Maybe you're still working through it. But how do you um, how do you kind of form that chemistry and work together and try not to butt heads, but get familiar with each other and just work through all those kinks? So for me, it, it's been incredibly easy. But I can tell you, so when this opportunity came up, it was one that I wasn't going to let pass by because T-Bob and I had done radio a couple of times here and there. He, yeah, y'all yeah. mixing Matt. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. feeling on everybody my show, in on everybody on his show, show whatever. Yeah. Especially during the, the quarantine process of the pandemic, right? So many people could come in this building. I think it was like five of us. And so we tried to help each other out. But for me, so I was doing Sirius XM SEC this morning, basically three, four times a week mm -hmm. from 710. So the same time slot. And so when this became available, honestly, I just, I didn't know if I could make it work, but I really wanted to because I wanted to work with T-Bob and I wanted to, to try to, to, to have that chemistry that I knew we already had in place because anytime we had done those shows together, even though it was a here or there, it was like, man, that was really easy. Yeah. And if you can do easy radio and be passionate about it, that to me is always the goal for it to be easy, not feel like work, not feel like you're just trying to figure out what to talk about for three hours. I'll be honest with you, man. It just, it, it happens easily in here. Like mm -hmm. we just get going and we're almost like, man, we're in the third hour already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for That's me, true. it was, okay, I got a big boy decision to make. I've got to change really my lifestyle. I've got to change because as y'all know, I have four children. Yep. And so if I take this job, my wife's going to be doing every carpool. She's going to be waking up, taking the kids to school. And my schedule is going to completely change because I was doing seven to 10 and then 12 to three. And then, but I was like, I really want the opportunity to work with T-Bob being morning drive in Baton Rouge. And so the first call I made was the Sirius XM. I said, Hey, here's the deal. Here's what I'm thinking. And they were fantastic uh, about saying, Hey, I understand that. So here's what we'll do. We'll let you do the 7 to 10 a.m. locally, and we'll move you from the, uh, the the 7 to 10 show to the 3 to 6 afternoon show, and it will be fine. It'll open up different doors for you. You can host on ESPNU maybe a little bit more as well. So all of it really just came together, and it happened so easily. Like, it was meant to be for me. Like, I'm a true believer, and, and things are meant to be. So once I made that call, for me, I wanted to be able every single morning, because like I said, I got comfortable when I was with my former teammates with mm -hmm. Flynn and Dixon. T-Bob and I were former teammates. And so oh. we had this chemistry. We had this shared thing that we were trying to do, winning a, a national title together. We joke about it. Like T-Bob was a young player. He was a scout team player of the week a couple two of times. Two times. Two times, <laughs> two times <laughs> right? Put some respect on the name. But In like, 07, there's a reason why Glenn Dorsey and Ricky Jean right. Francois were one so reason. good. It's one reason. It's okay. because of T-Bob. It but, was the phenom coming out of Norcross, Georgia, to a private school ball. They couldn't handle it. They'd never seen Tenacity. Such a talent. All right. No joke. I am happy that I got it twice there. Right. They didn't give it out twice. So he was on that team. We we're working towards a common goal. And obviously we kept in touch over the years. And I knew that we wouldn't have to force anything. Wait, hold on. Y'all y'all were not friends. There was no way that y'all talked T -Bob, and hung out. So T-Bob actually weaseled. True freshman, senior. I weaseled, know how to ingratiate myself. He weaseled his <laughs> way kids. into the older group. How? Yeah. Into the Flynn, Dixon. A uh, lot yeah. of With your charming um, personality. So I had a I had an in into the Dixon friend group because I'd grown up knowing Stephen Court because Stephen, Steve Court, his father, played O-line with my dad. Uh. Same, so... Had a Nepotism childhood in, in your favor there. yet again. Uh, yes, again. yes. Oh, look at this. I, had a, I, I had a childhood in there. Um, and then if there's one thing I can do, uh, it's party. And I <laughs> knew how to like, you know, sometimes you pull some. Uh, I, I actually saw Will Arnold last weekend and we were talking about this. I called it aggressively calculated uh, moves. Right. And so like. <laughs> that first house party they that we us. had my freshman year, which is at Matt Flynn's house, I decided to show up with a uh, like a fully unbuttoned Hawaiian shirt, hair pulled back. I had long hair at the time, an aggressive look. Uh, it's basically like the pickup artist. It's like peacocking bullshit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, uh, just a way of kind of <laughs> making your mark. And then look, whatever. I I think that we 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 had a good time together. But I mean, that was kind of how I started to get in with the older crowd, and then. And then Miller was in, you know, Ryan Miller's Matt's roommate, and he was in, uh, he was the center ahead of me, yeah, and I kind of viewed him like, room. like an older brother. He kind of took me under his wing. So there were a few ways that I weaseled my way in, and then I got Jake a uh, signed ball by Tom Glavin. And yeah, how about I was, that? Uh, I was a senior. <laughs> he was a freshman. He knew I was a Braves fan. He's like, hey, I happen to be neighbors with this guy. You might know him, and he tosses me this ball, and it's like Tom Glavin. I'm like. <laughs> this kid's okay. Climbing the social ladder what, is a real thing. I, you never struck me as like a calculating type of like 
social I mean, climber a like lot that. Of it I is, feel like a lot of it's natural. Yes, a lot. Okay. I mean, whatever, right? I just, like I said, I like to party yeah. and I like to try to be funny. <laughs> and that's probably why I ended up in radio to begin with. And yeah. it's my favorite part of the job. Like, yeah. My main goal for the morning show is I want people to have fun while they're listening. They're going to work. Work sucks. Like, nobody likes that. Uh, it, it, it's why when I was doing 8 to Midnight, that was part show, part politics. And I would go, uh, we would wade in some very mm. heavy territory. And it was a caller-driven show. So it would be a lot of live on-air debate. And I loved that as well. And it was fascinating. But I don't really want anything that heavy in the morning show because just the entire kind of mission statement of the show is different i'm not really here to educate hmm. like i'm just here to entertain yeah that, that, that is solely what i view our job at so i want you to feel like i want to put this on because i want to laugh i'm gonna have a good time and and, and then obviously uh maybe some sports insight kind of along the way mixed within there and so yeah i i don't want to sound like i'm like some sort of sociopath being like, this is the popular kids and I got to get in. But like, dude, I was a huge, kind Matt, of. I was like a huge Matt Flynn fan. That's crazy. And so I wanted to be friends with Matt Flynn. Like I, like on my official visit, I was like blown away when all of a sudden I'm playing guitar hero, drinking beers at Matt Flynn's house. I'm like, where am I right now? This is awesome, dude. Uh, random question. Did they live off Broussard? Do you, do you remember? So the, the house, the, the First house was somewhere in the Flower Streets, kind of, I think, off of Nicholson. Okay. But the main house over the years that Miller and Flynn and Sherry and them lived in was all at, uh, it was in uh, the Holy Triangle, the Beaupre <laughs> Triangle. It was say, in Lake yeah. Beaupre. But I lived I lived in the townhomes, mm-hmm. I lived in Lake Beaupre, and I lived in Beaupre. So I did okay. a lot of River Road and Brightside. Okay. I, I live in the Garden District now, kind of close to Bruce Hart, and one of my neighbors across the way has told me that some he thought it was Flynn, but he must have been wrong. Uh, could have lived been lived in that area, and they had some pretty, some pretty epic parties in that. I in do that know that there was a house over there. I think it was over there at least. The LSU swim team used to throw the most out of a movie scene Halloween rager that I've ever <laughs> seen in my entire life. I only went once, but I felt like I was on the set of Project X, and like I think the cops ended up shutting it down. It was unbelievable. Welcome to Tiger's Win, where you can learn about <laughs> yeah. uh, successful right. strategies. I interrupted you. What hey, were you? we're like I out of the statute of limitations, now. dude. This is out oh, ten good, years. Yeah. I'm 32 years old. I got I mean, two kids. You're good. You're I, good. I'm I, not worried about it. I will say, and, and I told this story on air the other day so i was terrified of going out and doing anything on like a thursday night just completely terrified because like somebody's gonna see me they're, they're gonna think i'm not doing what i'm supposed to be doing and my you know my wife would always ask like for halloween like can we can we go out can we do this and it was around halloween time one football season my senior year and we were already married she's like hey there's this there's this really you know big party it's not gonna get too crazy but i'd really like for you to go and it was on a thursday night and i'm like Bye week, <sighs> Halloween. Bye nah, week. It was, it was it was around that time. Yeah, it was around that time. Um, we had a game that week, and uh, she's like, "Come on, just one time. We'll have some fun. Whatever, whatever, whatever." So the only time I went out in my college career on a Thursday night was the Thursday before the Florida game. It's the only <laughs> time I went out. Hey, played played hey, well in the game. Correlation. I, I'll does never equal forget. Causation. Katie's like, so next Thursday? <laughs> yeah, you said is. yes, of course, right? Yeah. No, I we mean, did. I we, so of we lost to Arkansas because you didn't go out on yep. Thursday night. That's uh, about because right. you son of a gun. The rail route got called back for it's, not it's having enough minerals. Because scrimmage. freaking Peyton Hillis. <laughs> oh, that fourth down was like the loudest I've ever heard. Tiger Stadium. Uh I will say that 07 team is so funny. Uh, that was a hard chill party. Out, chill, bunch. Out, chill, chill, chill. That was a work hard, party hard bunch. And when I was a senior in 11, they used to always shame us and be like, you took the 07 guys. I was like, what are you talking about? I was there. It was Tiger Bar Tuesday. It was Mel and Mushroom on Wednesday. For a lot of guys, it was Reggie's on Thursday. Like, there was a routine. Like, I was my, uh, there. Th- that was my freshman year of college. And I remember being at Daiquiri Cafe. Yes, yeah, Sunday night. In, in Plaquemine, right? And Sunday nights, because that was the only place you could go drink on a Sunday and night. And it was on a Sunday night, and Colt David bought shots for the entire bar. And Sounds very I've had, I've had a very high opinion of Colt <laughs> David ever since So then. not for the fake field goal against South Carolina. I, I, honestly, all that stuff is kind of yeah. blurred together, all the fake field goals from, from uh, throughout the years, but I will never forget the 500 shots that he bought for the yeah, bar. There you go. I actually never made it to a deck cafe Sunday night. Not even for the uh, national championship celebration. Nope, never made it to a deck cafe. We found, we found out night. we were playing Ohio State on a Sunday night. So, so everybody right, immediately you, went to the cafe go? afterwards. <laughs> oh, that's great, dude. Um, let's let's talk about stories from your playing careers as we kind of are, are wrapping up here and the memories that stick out from LSU. And 
you know, we've talked about the fun that y'all had, obviously, but when you go through an experience like that, whether it's for four years, five years, two years, one year, it's going to affect the rest of your life. What, what are the things that you guys, I know that's a super broad question, but like the things you think about daily, the things that you do daily that are either habits you formed at LSU or voices that you first encountered at LSU, what are the things that you take away from your time playing here that have helped you now that help you get up and do a morning show and wake up at what? Yeah. Four 30. What time do you guys get up? Four yeah, thirty, five yeah. o'clock. I used to get up at four 30. I've actually been a bit lazier and I pushed that back to five. I recently, still think it's pretty early, which I, I should be maybe a little better about, but yeah. For like, so when you ask that question, the first thing that comes to my mind about like tendencies that I learned in a good way, they come from the weight room at LSU for me, at least in Tommy Moffat. Just like me thinking, let me get 30 extra minutes of sleep. Like I can still hear Coach Moffat like screaming, like early bird gets the worm, like when, before my alarm clock even yeah, goes the off. The second mouse gets you know, the cheese. You know what I mean? Like those are the type of things though. And, you know, Coach Moffat obviously still there, does a great job. But for me, like it's those relationships. Like mm-hmm. LSU is a very unique place in the fact that I haven't played at LSU in 14 years. But you know what I can do? I can go to the facility and I can talk with Jack Marucci. I can talk with Greg Stringfellow. I can talk with Tommy Moffat. I can talk with Corey Raymond. I can talk with all of these people that were there when I was there. I mean, Shelly Mullinex. I mean, I could go down the list mm-hmm. of people that are still in that building when I was there. That doesn't happen everywhere. Yeah. Like the turnover in college athletics is like almost yearly. And the fact that you can go to LSU and you've built these relationships. Like, I consider these people, like, really good friends of mine now. Mm-hmm. Like, obviously, they were people that, that I've respected throughout my entire life, and they were my superior. But, like, now that relationship has continued, and I can go have real conversations with these people. Like, if something comes up, like, Jack Murchie is usually one of my first phone calls. Yeah. that uh, I, I want you to answer the same thing, but it mm-hmm. reminds me of something I've talked about on this show before. And I actually, because I started doing this show, have changed some things in my life. And it's talking to Paul Maneri about mentors. And I realized at 32 years old that I've had all these mentors throughout my life that I've lost connection with because you get busy and you start Mm -hmm. working and you move from this area to this area. And 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 so like kids, yeah, yeah, everything else. Yeah. And they they consume your life. And so like literally a couple weeks ago, I called my old AAU basketball coach and said, Hey, let's grab lunch because like I haven't talked to you in forever and you were a huge influence in my life. And so we had lunch and it like, it was great, and that's that's something that LSU can be. I remember not working at LSU, and <clears throat> despite my uh, abundant family life with wife and two kids, feeling lonely sometimes at work because I'd be like, man, I, I miss being part of a team. Like, right. there's there's something you take for granted growing up, playing sports your whole life into college. You're always around team. You're always around teammates. And then you step away from that and then you go into the workplace and it's not that environment. And I remember missing that. And now that I'm back at LSU, is everything perfect and hunky dory? And, you know, I I love every aspect of every single day of my job. Absolutely not. There's difficult days and there's frustrations and you butt heads with people and there's competing. All that stuff that happens at every workplace happens there. But I feel like I'm part of a team again, which is weird because I grew up not really being an LSU fan and now I'm constantly wearing purple and gold because I feel that that feeling. No, I know exactly what you're saying. And it's one of the reasons why I do this, because I get to be a part of LSU. And there's only a couple of ways you can do it. You can do what we do. You can be a coach, right? And yeah. with my four children, I don't have time to coach. Like that is a, that's a, man, that is a responsibility where you're up there a lot. Like we know that. Yep. We know the coaches grind. And so this gives me the opportunity to still be around the program. Because you just don't want to leave it. Like you want to be around the program and you want to be around these great people that are still within the program. And that's one of the best things. And then throughout that, and you've done this as well, like you create these relationships with the current athletes as well. Mm -hmm. And you almost, you know, you get the opportunity to follow them throughout their career and root for their success. And like, I've created great relationships with now former LSU players just through interviewing them and having, and now they're like, they're involved like with my children. Like Clyde Edward D. is maybe one of the best human beings you'll ever meet. Mm -hmm. He gets drafted by the Chiefs. My son, Hudson, and, and T-Bob knows this, is now a Chiefs fan yeah. because of Tyron and Clyde mm-hmm. Edwards-Elair. And, Poor and, dad. And Clyde, yeah. Played for two other AFC West teams. teams. <laughs> but, you know, Clyde now, like, sent my son a birthday message the other day. Yeah. And, like, it's, it's through that, like, what you're saying, like, being part of a team. Like, I feel like if you ever played for LSU, if you've ever worked for LSU, 
Like you're part of that team and everybody just understands it. Like even if you don't, you know, I, I was a well done playing career when, when Clyde played, but just that relationship and, uh, you know, Devin White's another one that kind of comes to mind and Stradavius White, all these guys that if you played LSU, it's just like this brotherhood that you stay within, you never get out of. Uh, yeah, I, I guess to go back to the original question for me, uh, things that I think about every day, the main uh, person in that vein would be Tommy Moffitt, without a doubt. Yeah. You spend the most time with the strength coach. Um, in a lot of ways, the strength coach is the person who's going to push you more to your kind of physical and mental limits mm -hmm. and make you break through some of those barriers. Uh, so it's going to be a time, guy that you experience a lot of pain with, a lot of uh, criticism with, but also a lot of kind of building back up as well. And I've always said it. I think that Coach Moffitt is the best coach that I've ever had in anything ever, and I will stand by that till my dying day. I think he is the X factor behind the LSU Golden Age, and I don't even think it's particularly close. Mm. How are you uh, continuing to put guys in the NFL at a constant rate, even when we now see obviously how subpar the coaching had gotten at time? It's because the training side of things is just unparalleled. And there are sayings every single day that, you know, he used to yell at us that still stick with me to this day. Uh, I mean, one of them, and it applies to any job and anything in life, really, is just prior preparation prevents poor performance, uh, whatever that is, like five Ps. But, like, you want to not feel anxious about something big you have to do? Prepare your ass off. Mm. You want it to be good? Prepare your ass off. I'm not saying I always do. I'm not saying I always live by that. But the days in which I don't are the days when I feel like the show sucks and are the days that I'm mad at myself for not doing what I needed to do because I got yep. lazy. So, like, these are lessons that have stuck with me. And, and then, really, I would just say athletics in general. Outside of maybe even LSU, just the value of athletics and challenging yourself physically, mentally, if it's a team sport, learning social dynamics, how to work with others, how to maybe become a leader or how to follow, or how, if you are a leader... How do you deal with different people? And like how like you got to coddle this guy, you got to get on this guy's ass and uh, just or, or how to deal with things that frustrate you and set you back. How do you respond to it? Do you cave? Do you kind of rise to the challenge? Like I always talk about it, but I, I was never a starter going into uh, any fall camp uh, in all my years at LSU. I ended up starting three years. And that's just because yeah, that was really tough. It used to really piss me off, but I would just try to kind of Put the blinders on and stay focused, right? And so just the value, the lessons, the life lessons that you can learn in athletics, and a lot of it's an art too, right? We talked earlier about the ability to be really honest with yourself and self-critique is very vulnerable. It's very tough, and you really just don't want to do it. Uh, but being forced to, I think, makes you better in the end. And sports does a ton of that. Like I said, I think art does. But uh, certainly LSU football pushed me to limits and, and made me learn things about myself that um, give you a confidence going into life where you're like, okay, I know I can do this because I've kind of, I've, I've, I've been to the edge of the abyss before. I'm glad you mentioned the word vulnerability and we'll start wrapping up here, but I've been on a vulnerability, uh, that's hard to say, vulnerability kick uh, recently because I've been reading Brene Brown's book, uh, Daring Greatly, which is a fantastic book. Um, oh. I, have a, I have a thing this year. I'm a Huge reader. Last I try to. Well, I say huge reader. I try to read two books a month. That's like okay. been my goal for a while. Okay. And this year, I made a promise to my wife. I said, of those two books, I want you to pick one, and I'll read one, and like it'll help us like understand each other better. Mm -hmm. So this is one that she recommended to yeah. me, and it's great. Like it's it's. I'm definitely not the target audience for it. You guys aren't, and a lot of people watching probably aren't. But it's hugely insightful, and it's all about vulnerability. And I view it through the lens, obviously, because I create stuff of creation, content creation, and. Um, it's a very vulnerable thing putting your art out there like and that. It, it's, it is. And if you go back to the 2019 season, we made a bunch of cool stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And got a lot of praise for it. And I definitely enjoyed that praise. Uh, I tried to keep it in perspective, but I enjoyed it. 2020, the team's not as good. The content is harder to make. And a lot of criticism mm -hmm. comes your way. Yeah. Um, and so it's, 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 it, and I think you guys can understand this both as, I'm Athletes. dealing with the purple and gold stuff. I mean, on 2019, I did yes. that radio segment, Purple and Gold, where I was basically made 18, 15 minute. <laughs> Don't you hate when you like, commit to something? Radio plays, <laughs> and it was simultaneously the most work intensive thing I've ever done, but also the most fulfilling thing I've ever done professionally. Yes. But I still, to this day, am trying to come up with something new to do instead of it, and I cannot. Yep. And I feel like that pressure, that failure to come up with something new every single day. It sucks. Yep. But. 
you guys, so you guys can connect to that where, especially in this industry and especially as you two are creating a new show, a new iteration of a show that's been around for, I mean, I remember, was it 2014 or 2015, whenever Off the Bench started, it was Collide and the Prince. I remember I was working at Dig Magazine at the time in my one year break from Tiger Act. I remember sitting at the desk at six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning, trying to get this magazine done on a Tuesday. And the show came on and like listening to it and be like, oh, this is like new. This is different for Baton Rouge. Yeah. And now y'all have to take that to an audience that has grown expectations of what the morning show should be in Baton Rouge, of what their experience wants to be. And yes, you're going to get the praise for it. And there's going to be people who say, I love Hester and I love T-Bob. And then there's going to be people who don't Absolutely. say that, right? And so I'm curious as you guys transition from athletes to creators, that balance of being open and being vulnerable and being willing to take risks and fail and how you learn that as athletes and, and just that delicate walk that you have to take of, I'm going to open up myself and make something, but I'm going to try not to let it affect me too much. I'm going to try not to invest myself so much in my work that when my work suffers, it's not a personal attack on myself. Yeah. And there's some people that I guess would be a little terrified to, come into a show that was really successful. I, I mean, it has been a brand for yeah, you know, no, six I mean, years. I, yeah, before I stepped into it, it was already so, yeah, hugely so to your successful. Point, there's some people that do love it. But uh, for me, I think my mentality does come from my father. And it goes back to when I was choosing a school to go play for. And, you know, I always wanted to go to LSU. I was raised in Louisiana. And they, they offered a little bit later than other, other teams. But when they did, I was so excited. But then I was like, man, They've got a guy that just won the MVP of the national championship games at freshman, and yeah. Justin Vincent. They've got Ali Broussard. He he just like set the record. They got Joe Adai as a sophomore. He's gonna be a first round pick. Shiron Carey, uh, Barrington Edwards was uh, here before he transferred. He ended up being the starter at North Carolina, but he was really talented football mm -hmm. player, right? And so all these guys, I remember kind of wondering like, okay, they're already established. What am I gonna do there? And and T's heard this quote before. My dad looks at me and says, Jacob. If you're scared of competition, change your last name. Mm. And when he said that to me, I, I, mean, I still get chills saying you're it mumble. right now. And so I take that, I really take that that saying to, every, that. to everything that I do. And so, yeah, it's a little nerve wracking. Like I'm changing my schedule up. I'm changing, you know, a show where it had my name on it. And not, you know, me, I don't care about any of that, but I'm going to a show that's already established, really successful. And, you know, you, you s somewhat worry, okay, is this, is this the right move? Is it going to work for me? But just the challenge of it and the excitement of it and all those things, like dude, if you're scared in your decisions that you make, you're never going to make a great one because you're not going to have passion in any decision that you make. You're just going to play it safe your entire mm -hmm. life. And so for me, I really thank my father for that mentality that I had because, look, I, I realized that like throughout my football career, uh, man, you got this little bow-legged, slow white running back out there. What are we doing here? Like I know there's some people that aren't going to enjoy that, okay? Yeah. But whatever, you can't listen to that. All you can worry about is the things that you can control. And you've got to, you know, do the things that he's mentioned and Coach Moffitt gave us to be able to do so, you know, outwork everybody, be prepared, all those type of things. And so for me, I'm very thankful that that was a mentality that I was given because nobody's going to lo like love everything that you do. In fact, if everyone loves you, you're probably not doing it right, mm -hmm. right? If you're trying to make everyone happy because you're not allowing it to be yourself and authentic. Yeah. You have to be authentic in this business. I know. So for me, that's always something that every time this situation pops up, I think of my dad looking at me in the living room. I'll never forget the look that he had. And he said that to me. And I try to really use that in a lot of things in life. If you're scared, go to church. Uh, or if no, you're mocking, no, no. if you're scared by a dog. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think that, um, no, I think, I think being scared of anything that's new to you or stepping into anything like that, I think being scared is completely fine. I think what we all want to try to do and not say that we all do it all the time, but, so I definitely don't, but you want to try to not let that fear dictate your decision. It's okay to be scared, right? right? I am a firm believer uh, in like the old quotes about, you know, without fear, how can there be courage, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not really being brave if you're not scared of what you're doing. You're just doing it. It's fine. It's easy. So fear is fine. Fear is natural. Overcoming fear, I think, is where you can kind of push yourself to end up growing. Um, and look, as, as far as like like dealing with some of the negativity, uh, yeah, it sucks some days, and some days it gets to you more than the others. And I think our brains are just hardwired where positive comments don't mean much to you. You know, they feel good, but like a little hit, like, oh, look, that's really nice they said that. 
But that's not really what sticks with you because mm-hmm. you think it's good. You expect to be good. That's why you're doing it. It's like that's your job. And so it ends up being a lot of times those negative comments that kind of weasel into your brain and can sit there. And and that's an ongoing battle, I think, for anybody in a job like this where it, and now the feedback's so direct through the chat or through Twitter or whatever. It's just an ongoing battle of trying to compartmentalize that, not allowing yourself to give in. I mean, I mean, just a couple weeks ago, like when we went through the switch uh, after Jordy got fired, I was really upset. And obviously it's all very public. And so there's people in the comments and I'm having to carry the show solo for like three weeks, which obviously then becomes a hugely different show. Yep. And so, you know, you just have people chiming in constantly about like, oh, I like this show better. or The show sucks now or two up socks or this. Or and like, a golden rule is just never engage with anything negative online, right? Mm. Nothing good ever comes from it. Uh, but even I broke down, and, like, some girl or something was on Twitter, like, I'm sorry, he's just not a host, blah, blah, he's just blah, blah, blah. And uh, I don't know. I think I, like, told her, like, F off or something. Yeah. And then um, and then I deleted the tweet, and I was like, it was a moment of weakness. But I, I guess the point being is that I don't – some people say it just becomes easy for them. I've not had that experience, like, trying to deal with the negativity. I, I think it's – some days it's easy and you're feeling uber confident when they catch you at a vulnerable, insecure time. Mm-hmm. I think it really does can mess with you. But you just have to, I mean, I think that's where kind of the support of your friends, your family helps out. And then you just have to have some belief in yourself and kind of know that your brain a lot of times is going to be naturally insecure. And so it's going to kind of... um it's not always going to be your friend. Like a lot of times, some of the thoughts that your brain are putting in your head are not reasonable or not correct. It's just some of your fears uh, just kind of shooting to the surface. And so it's just a constant battle of trying not to let those insecurities define you. But, but yeah, I, I still struggle with it. But since that last time when I told her to F off, like I have not engaged with any of it. <laughs> I hadn't engaged with any of it for a while before that. So I tried to, that's, how I try to approach it, but yeah. it's it's ongoing. The only the only time it's okay to fire back at someone online is if it's a Florida Gator fan. Then it's completely okay. <laughs> Alabama. I'll, I'll give you a that. full endorsement of it, and I'll help you do so if you yeah, need my help. Yeah, and I mean, look, and like, yes, I mess with Bama fans. Like, I'm not saying like that. Like, I I, I, I like trash talking to stuff, but I was like really actually mad at this girl, and <laughs> yep. and I hate that I let her have that power over me. The the book that I mentioned, um, it gets its title from the. Teddy Roosevelt speech, the man in the arena mm. that I'm sure you've heard a million times, but there's a, a great quote that she pulls off of it yeah. that's inspired by it. It says, vulnerability is not knowing victory or defeat. It's understanding the necessity of both. It's engaging. Mm. It's being all in. And Ooh. and I've I've Ooh. sunk my Ugh. teeth into that one. That's why I was searching yeah. my phone while y'all were talking. I wasn't ignoring you guys. I was trying to find the quote. I thought, <laughs> I thought you were trying to see if Arsenal was started yet. No, we're not going to talk about Arsenal. <laughs> okay, that, that, sorry. Arsenal, Arsenal knows more defeat than victory lately. I don't want to get. I don't want to get into the. Ars- I don't want to get into the Arsenal talk. But I've taken that to heart because the feeling that you had when you snap back, I've had that feeling so many times in the last year, two years, really, to a number of different people. Yeah, and I think for the most part, I've kept it reined in. I may have let it slip once or twice here and there, but like <laughs> it's also going back and be like, you know what? That's human. That's to feel that when there's somebody criticizing your play on the football field yeah. or your your performance in front of the microphone or whatever, that's totally normal. You make the mistake, you accept it, you learn from it, and you move on. And to me, that's what sports taught me. And a lot of it was so internalized that you don't really externalize it until you get past it. But that's why I want to have these conversations in this space is because it's necessary to externalize those things. One, for me to learn them, And then like maybe a little bit less selfishly for other people who listen and engage with our stuff. Like, yeah, we're going to talk about quarterbacks and we're going to talk about, you know, winning a national championship and we're going to make hype videos and all that stuff. But we can engage deeper than that and we can come out of it like being better at what we do and better with each other. And the worst one is the ones that really get to you or when no matter how much of an asshole way they delivered it, that they're kind of right. <laughs> right? Like when, when you know you didn't put in the effort that you should have, or yeah. you know you screwed something up, and then they call you out on it. So I think there's also kind of like like any criticism, some of it's out of left field, it is valueless. But sometimes if you can get through some of the more kind of BS trappings of something, like even then if you're being really honest with yourself, like you said, brutally self-honest, 
sometimes you can be like, you know what, I think they're actually right here. I need to be better in this regard in the future and so I can avoid this in the future. But, but sometimes it's okay. It's okay to take that criticism. You have to know that sometimes that criticism is not coming from a hateful place. It's coming from a, hey, here's what I observed in this situation. My first ever promotion uh, deal we did for CST for the LSU Game Day show, I had I'd never done TV. Like I said, I did some radio in San Diego. My first opportunity was TV, and we're doing promos. And I read the promos on teleprompter, and I was like, oh, okay, that went well. And I remember Victor Howe being like, hey, hey, whoa, 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 Hess. <laughs> He's like, you just basically were, were talking where only dogs could hear you. You've got to oversell it. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'm talking used car salesman because yeah, that's TV going, talk is so different. He said oh, that's so going to come off like normal talk on the, yeah. on the TV screen. I'm talking about, Cody, I, I got three words out. He's like, whoa, 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 no. <laughs> and like, there's some people you can take that the wrong way. Like, what do you mean? I, I know what I'm doing. Like, I was like, thank you so much yeah. because they went back and they replayed both clips. And I was like, that's going to be way over the top at first. But yeah. it's like, no, that's, that's what you need to do. Vic's been in this business for a long time. You have to take that. Huh. You have to learn from that. And He's been in the arena. Be, yeah. I always be wonder if like young me was able to see me nowadays. Would I find myself entertaining or was I think I would douchebag? I, I, <laughs> I don't like I always I don't know. I don't know the answer. Yeah. You just kind of jog that in my head, though, because, yeah, there are things that I do now in this show that back that, that I do think do play well and are right for like the audience and everything that I think back in the day I would have been like, ooh, that's a little uncool. Like, I don't know if I want to do that. Well, yeah. I think what you said there is if if they're in the arena with you then they're worth listening to. And if they're not, then maybe it's that's when you, you right. draw the line. Um, let's wrap up because I know y'all got to get out of here. The show, how's it going? Anything you want to plug, promo? Any I think goals, it's going really well. I never, I never really got to say uh, my uh, my piece on on Jacob joining, but I, I was obviously really uh, – it was out of nowhere when, when, when Jordy was taking off the show, and I was very upset about it. Um, and it was kind of a godsend to have Jake come into the show because like he said, there is a lot of natural chemistry there. And that's something that's only going to improve. Cause like even me and Jordy back when we originally did the show, they redeveloped some great chemistry. Right. And then we thought that would click right back in immediately. Uh, when I got back down here from new Orleans and it didn't, it probably took like a year. Yeah. Like to the point where at one point I was so discombobulated that I make the right choice. It all felt so bad that I like, on my birthday, right after I first moved back here, I went into my closet and actually cried to myself. I was like, wow. this is, it was just all the public comments yeah. and everything. Good and, you know, like you said, walking to a successful show and people were hating it. And it was just brutal. Uh, but that chemistry came. So what I'm even more excited about, like, even now is, like, I feel like the base chemistry level we're working from is super high. And so as we get into the summer months and we're forced to be more creative and, you know, we're about to start to try to, take the show in some new ways too. Now that we've kind of got settled in, uh, I'm very, I'm, I'm very excited about, uh, the potential of what the show could end up being for sure. Yeah. Same, same for me as well. I mean, I think it's only going to continue to grow and actually we have a new YouTube studio here in guarantee media that has a green screen. So endless possibilities with that, obviously, <laughs> but also some of the serious stuff we can do, like yeah. breaking down some X's and O's and, oh, yeah. and really going behind coverages on defenses, fronts on defenses. Uh, you know, when you say things like empty package on offense, well, explain to me what you're talking about. When mm -hmm. you say two-man route combinations, well, what does that mean? And because obviously sometimes on radio, you can't really get that across. And even in a TV studio, you still have radio listeners, but also we can add that to our YouTube page. And so, you know, Gordy does a really nice job here at Guarantee of always forward thinking and always having like whatever's next ready for us to go. And so that's the next level that I'm excited about. Well, uh, I'll be watching. I'll be taking copious notes and being very critical of you guys as you Thank continue you. to develop yes. and just making yeah. sure you know how terrible you are at what you do and how much <laughs> yeah. more. Uh, you do. By the way, T Bob's going on vacation in a couple of weeks. So if you yeah, how about some yeah. more of that free, free labor, work. Right? Free I labor. Knew, I knew you you're in this building. Reason. How about I mean, some more of that free work? Yeah. Yeah. If I can come in at about six fifty-five and just kick my feet up and and BS, then I'm down. Also, oh, um. If you're that girl listening, hit me up on Twitter. <laughs> I'm sorry I shot back at you that way. I'm sorry I shot back at you that way. I should not have. I, I think you were being a jerk, but I should not peace have responded love. Just say peace way. and love, and it's a blanket over everything. Love, peace, and chicken grease. There you go. That's from Even better. The Pest. <laughs> one of my favorite movies as a child, but I don't know. I don't think pest. it's viewed as one of John Leguizima's uh, gems. I loved it, though. I forgot about The Pest. Yeah. Um, I think that's a natural ending yeah. point, The Pest. Obviously, The Pest. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you for being on Tigers 1. Appreciate you. Uh, thank, thank you, you Cody. Brother. Beautiful.
Alright. Sorry, I kept you 